Hey, everybody. Um, we're working on the presenter's audio at the moment. So let's unmute Mark and see if we can hear him. Oh, where'd he go? Oh, there he is. Okay, so Marcus says you're self-muted, so you'd have to unmute yourself. There we go. There, we go. there I am. You're here. We can hear you. All right, that's Hooray. good. <laughs> that's, that's our first but, hurdle. But that's my phone. That's not my computer. Understood. Okay. So we've got your it's computer in the back room as a presenter, so we should be able to show your screen. Okay. Right. Yeah, so I think we're good. All right. We're, it was, it was uh, interesting back here before we got started. Um, Mark was in here three times. Two of them we could bring to the back room, but one of them we couldn't. And that's the one where we could hear him. <laughs> so we wanted to make sure we could hear him before we got going. So anyway, um, continuing on our, our uh, journey, I guess, of things that we will be able to do again someday in the world, once we can all move about, is this. I saw a documentary where these people went on a narwhal watching thing and you go up and you and you camp out in the arctic and it's it's right off of canada right mike do you know about uh, it is uh, part of uh, nunavut which is one of the uh, northwest one of the territories there's three territories in canada uh the yukon territories the northwest territories and nunavut uh, northwest yeah. territories used to be the whole darn great big thing except for the yukon and they split it up at one point and added none of it i'll have none of it yeah well exactly <laughs> that's that's how we all remembered how we how to say it but Okay. Well, I'll have some of it because I want to do this. This looks like a cool thing to do. I guess you go up there for, a, I don't know, a week or something. It's cold, but look at you all know. the stuff you get to see. I mean, yeah. So you, you're you going to go camp down there in your little shorts? In my little shorts. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go in my so, little shorts. You know, something really cool about uh, narwhals, they're often referred to as the unicorns of the sea. And, and a lot of people mistakenly think that that thing is a horn. And it's actually a tooth, believe it or not. Oh, well, One of its right. teeth yeah. just grows way the heck out wide. And I think there's a, sometimes narwhals, or maybe there's another kind of whale or something, actually will sometimes have two going out. But, uh, but wait, 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 is that coming out of a mouth? Yes, it's coming out of its mouth. Or 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 just a spot right by the mouth, but it is a tooth and not it, a horn. It looks like it's where the nose would be. Uh, exactly, that's that's what it seems. But it is definitely a tooth that's growing. Well, at least he doesn't have the flaws. Yeah, quite. <laughs> just rubs it against an iceberg. Yeah. Uh, uh, as long as it doesn't poke me. Whoa! Doesn't that seem like a, it's neat a great thing place to, to store do, donuts? Though? It would be know. very cool. Yeah, quite. Yeah. yeah. Playing a game of ring class. Okay. <laughs> I know it's not cheap. In the documentary, it was kind of neat, though, because they were kind of watching the weather because the ice was starting to melt where they were camping. And so they had to kind of break camp quickly and get out of there. And so they're zooming along on the on these um, snowmobiles. And, mm -hmm. and they're just kind of skirting over where it's melted. So they're kind of going through water. <laughs> instead of ice on the snowmobile just, just had to go fast and get through it but they made it back so that, that was kind of neat anyway things we will do once again when we can okay uh good morning good evening good afternoon everybody out there in clarion live land this is the clarion live weekly webinar see it and learn it and share it this is webinar number 585 Today is October 23rd, 2020, Clarion Date 80288. All webinars are recorded and available at clarionlive.com. And please join us on Skype. And we are streaming right now to 12 Clarionites on YouTube. All over the world. Point. All over the world. And sometimes people ask us, how soon will the recording be up? The recording is up right now. You could, if you were watching it on YouTube, you could pause it if you wanted to and come back to it later. You could um, go back and watch the beginning again and watch us do an audio test. You could, you could, it's just like a DVR. It's a YouTube DVR. It's what it is. And I just, I just wanted to say we're at 585. And I find it remarkable that we've had 585 people, not, not, not all unique people, but people come and help us do Clarion stuff 585 times. That's mm -hmm. a lot of time. Mike's, Mike's done 
582 times, and then the other three <laughs> times true. the rest of us have been looking. Right. Yeah, I'll have to look, but I'm not sure how many I've done. I, 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 it's got to be upwards of 50, I would guess. You know, maybe more than that. Probably more. We can find that. out. We can find out. It's on the website, right? They're, all of them are linked together. It's a database. We can do. It is. Quick. Yeah. Do, do yeah. a count of. <laughs> we can do a count. Um, developers, we can do that. Anyway, for all of those, uh, just thank you for volunteering and coming and mm -hmm. spending a couple hours of um, a week with us and sharing all of your clarion knowledge. And that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Is that all, John? About that. That's it. I'm done. Take over. I'll keep going. Okay, your host for today's webinar. Arnold's with us today. Hello, Arnold. Aloha. <laughs> Arnold's birthday webinar. July times two. There you go. It's alive, but we're having it in October. We have it right? when we have it. Yeah, when we have it. We like to have uh, it. I'm here. This is John. Uh, Lisa's not with us today. Bruce is with us today for a short time. Hello, Bruce. I just made himself. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Yeah. Good. And Bruce, I wanted to, I'm in a thankful mood today. It's not even Thanksgiving. I'm just in a thankful mood. Thank you for doing the uh, open webinars with me i oh and that's they good fun aren't they yeah i have They're to thank fun. you for doing that too because i couldn't do it <laughs> <laughs> we, we we learn a lot uh because it's just a free form thing you know there's no formal presentation but we you know people come in they'll share stuff or they have a question and we'll end up going down a, a track that i've never been on before and it's kind of fun but yeah so thanks for for uh popping in and doing those especially with the the new youtube format where we can see each other and it's good times. So thank you for that. Yeah. And Mike Hansen is cool. uh, also with us today. Our pianist. Happy and to Mike, be thank here. Thank you for doing those 500 and some webinars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever going. that number is that we will eventually <laughs> right, exactly. maybe find out because we just, we're yeah. supposed to be able to do that. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> the query. Rules of the webinar, all attendees are muted. That means we can't hear you type your questions in the questions box. We will read them to the presenter. If you want to speak, we encourage you to do so. And type in the question box. Raise your hand, type in the question box. Finally, dress appropriately. Four. I don't know. I'm running out of rules, really. For anything, I guess. I well, mean, I don't know how you dress appropriately in your home office. I was thinking more of the weather. You know, it's getting cold, so. Oh, in that sense, sure. I, that was my thought. Um, I have to put on a sweatshirt now because it's cold out. I don't. It is chilly, yeah. isn't it? It is chilly up here. Yeah. So anyway, that's more of a tip than a rule. Yeah, it might be a rule. What's up today? We have a feature presentation with Mark Riffey doing Beyond Debug View, and it's Arnold's birthday in October. And oh, I left him up in the coming soon. He's not coming soon again. He's coming soon just today. October 30th, uh, nothing. We don't have anything scheduled. So we invite you to volunteer if you'd like to present. And B um, number 586. Six. Six. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, contact us, clarionlive at gmail.com, or you can find us on Skype, or really good contact any of us. Contact. Just contact us. Yeah. Yes, just contact us. We'll get you, get you on. Um, the sooner the better, so John can take away those question marks. Yes, and, uh, and then we have all of November too, except for Don will be with us on November 6th. Don's become um, quite the presenter recently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really cool. He's doing all sorts of neat stuff and he's happy to share and we'd love to have him. So he'll be here in a couple of weeks and he's done some really cool things. He actually showed a bit of it on the open webinar but then he'll be presenting a, a formal presentation here coming up in November. So. You know, I think Gorman just Skyped me. He's, he, he needs a little love. I think we can give him a, a week there. He does need a little love. Uh, um, he had a presentation that I wasn't necessarily convinced. Thank you. Of, um, but I think I might be convinced. Yeah, Sometimes. we'll see. Well, can you take the the three hundred page one, not the seven hundred page one? I thought maybe that's why you were going to give him a week. Bang! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love to give Mike grief about his long slideshows. <laughs> <laughs>
Anyway, guess what happened last Saturday? Uh, had, donut holes. The, the three, third three was amazing. Is that what happened on Saturday? <laughs> kind of. We uh, yeah, the third of six presentations. We still don't have the uh, the sixth one figured out yet. But anyway, yeah, Dries came on. Um, it was it was just shy of two hours. He has a lot to share for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did really well. There's we have good attendance. I hope people learn something from it. I sure did. That and was very cool. Yeah. yeah. For those wondering what donut holes are, it's it's putting a uh, a window on a window, basically. And it's it's a threaded window that goes onto another threaded window. Hey John, you know it would be four hours if he slowed down. <laughs> That's right. But uh, again, another excellent presentation. And I liked how uh, he got to about an, just about an hour and a half in, and we figured, okay, he's probably gonna wrap up. That's about a normal CIDC thing. But then he goes, he says, so this is a CID presentation and we expect a little bit more out of that. So, and then he went on <laughs> to show us something even more. Yeah, he, he, he kept yeah. upping his game all the way through he his did. session. It's like- He did. And then Initially, we thought, okay, like, so that, that must be it. really goes, cool at the start. And then each, each step he went up. So, wow. And it, yeah. wow. Oh my God. It's amazing. <laughs> Indeed. Yep. And then, uh, then he had one more after that that upped it again. So, good job, Dries. Much appreciated. Everybody, all our presenters have been fantastic. And uh, we're looking forward to Andy on the 21st of November. And if you would like to attend, if you're not signed up, you can sign up at CIDC2020. Com. Dot com. Dot com. We have announcements. Uh, there was a Noantis user group meeting. Andy's here. He can tell us about it. I think it was a reasonably short one. I think it was about an hour. Yeah, yeah, just over the hour mark, something like that. Nothing crazy. Um, we covered, we covered, it was more uh, report control. There's just been a new update, so we covered the actual content of it. And then even though we just got the update out, John requested a change. <laughs> um, of course. Uh, so we covered the contents of basically uh, reset variables and reset uh, visibility and so on. Uh, so yes, yeah, so that change, actually John, I'm not sent to you, but that change has now been done as requested. Um, and then it was highlighted a potential issue regarding uh, some of the 90s products and resize and split version 5 which I've still got to uh, speak to Bruce about so maybe maybe a Wednesday topic Bruce uh, I might just do some research before then and then uh, we could have a quick look together on the yeah, open web there. so uh, so because we're both busy I know that but uh, but yes yeah, there's been two or three reports so we better take a quick look uh, and it's it's not that like they're erroring it's just that they're not repainting correctly on, uh, on startup but that was it that was Monday's webinar there you go uh wednesday we had a we had a webinar as well and bruce was there i was there i was i was you were there what happened john i'm trying to remember it and and, and yeah. while we were doing it i'm thinking i need to remember this because this was really cool and now i've just forgotten it uh, <laughs> what, what it was that we did andy was there uh andy, was there? andy did a question <laughs> on Oh, is it brass? Is it brass being reset? Yes, there was a thing on yep. brass being reset. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was someone J files. I'm sure there was a question came in on J files uh, and been. to do with the structure because you you showed the I'd not seen it before, but you showed a web interface oh, which uh, writes out some code. Right. That's right. So oh. Michael, was it Michael? Yeah, it was. Uh, and then we did the icon thing, oh. the win event icon thing. I remember. Yeah. I remember That's what right. the, yep. the, the big discussion was for Merle. He was asking about uh, he wants to switch his software That's to go right. to software as wow. a service, and so that that triggered um, a pretty long discussion, I think, on the pluses and minuses and how to get started and that kind of thing. And then we referred him back to the um, my birthday webinar from my birthday webinar from last year, where we did a two-parter on getting started with SaaS. So yeah, that was a that was a good discussion. I will start to try and uh, make those. So on a so on a Friday, we're not guessing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
we're always guessing. Um, yeah, that would be cool to have a note taker. Because so I think uh, Noantis takes notes and NetTalk takes notes, but the open webinar is sadly doesn't take notes. So but Mary's should... sitting around doing nothing through the webinar, so we should press gang her. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> you threw a question to him and he did well. He answered it very well, in fact. All right. No, no, Mary. Um, Andy. Oh, Mary. Mary, Mary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I don't know. Well, maybe I'll ask her. Okay. Uh, NetTalk user group. Yes. What happened, happened in NetTalk 1? Uh, we mumbled a little bit about NetTalk 12, mostly without being very specific about much. We chatted a bit about why you might get long response requests in your server. Uh, we took a deep dive into the security tab and the what code gets generated when a user must be logged in or have a level set or something like that. And Ashley's got an issue with different session IDs changing. And so we did a deep dive into how to debug that and what might be triggering that. Um, Mark had a question about CSS. Mike had a question. Says here, Mike had a question about select and network browse. I don't know what that means. Oh, <laughs> I don't have to go read it. This is ring any bells. Um, Peter had a question about um, a, a system he's building for a municipality and how do you link people to users? So I mean, they're real people out there and they've got to be linked to the, the municipality's licensees, the people who pay for licenses. So there's quite an interesting discussion because that's that's not a that's not so much a technical thing as a user thing. And and how do you want to go about that? That was quite a, an interesting discussion. Um yeah, and that was pretty much it. All right. Um and what brings us to next week, which we got questions. So we'll figure out something. We always do. Okay, that brings us to our next week if you want me to, by the way. So if you need me, you got me. So you get to your 501st? Sure. Well I, well, I did a quick little count. It turns out, including the ones where I was one of the panelists on a given, on a given thing, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the ones where I did myself, there's actually over 150. Wow. Uh, that I got my name on there. So that's a little frightening. And kind of cool. It's very cool. We're gonna have just, to, uh, I had no idea. So I was long. <laughs> I was so uh, I was so <laughs> prolific. So there you go. Yeah, this this two hundred hours your life. Can I blow the candles out now? <laughs> Not yet. You gotta wait to uh, wait for us to sing happy birthday. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Well, hey, here we are. Mike, up to the present. I, I hope you get into the six six hundreds too. As we will. So we're ready. Uh, shall we switch ready? over to Mark's screen? Yeah. So the question is, which Mark Riffey do we show? Uh, who's the real one? The one that says "Make this presenter." I assume that <laughs> is correct. Mike wins the prize. Huh? Oh, I'm just paying okay. attention. Uh, it's not like it's yelling at us in uppercase. You know. <laughs> Stop <laughs> shouting! So hard to read. Like yeah. All right. Let's see if this works. Um, I have to take my hat off to you for going beyond the Call of Duty with thirty something <laughs> slides. Yeah. So I just um... let me introduce Mark Riffey, the no slide presenter. <laughs> I've spoken a lot, and the only time I've had slides practiced today, I've been given the, some of the places that you speak, they give you like a template, and you have to use the template. So, like if you have 600 slides, you have to reformat them all. I, I would never have 600 slides, but so I just, mm. I just always had like three slides like hello, speak, goodbye. Mm. Um, but anyway, this one is a a nod to Arnold and a nod to John as well. You'll see why here shortly, but anyway. So um, what I wanted to talk about today is kind of something that, um, that I've wanted to do for a while and I finally got it done uh, recently, uh, which is why this took so long to happen because that was kind of a sort of a side project kind of, and um, but it was something I needed in production 
And it was something that I thought would be good to share, which is why I decided to make it kind of a side project and make it part of Arnold's birthday. Um, and basically the, the premise of the discussion is that, you know, we all use the bug view and um, it's, it's, you know, it's great when you're testing an app that's on your desktop, but when you're testing an app that's on a server somewhere and you have 10 of those servers or 20 of those servers, it starts to become kind of unwieldy and uh, you know because you're you're rdping or whatever uh into that server to to look at the log and if you wanted to find out something that happened at 8 a.m eastern time and you're in mountain time like i am well you can't really leave the log open all day because it'll suck up all the ram in the machine eventually and it also hits hurts performance um so i didn't want to just leave debug view running all over the place and suffer those, um, you know, that baggage, I guess. So I started looking for another solution and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So now let's see if I can actually make the slideshow work. Uh, speaking of the slideshow, um, does it look all right for you guys? Hello. Yes, it's, uh, it, in fact, it's, it's a very <laughs> eye-catching slide, nice color gradient, uh, good font choices, uh, nice spacing, uh, very impressive so far. The, the fact that you can see it and it doesn't look goofy because of the resolution or whatever, What's that's that what I mean. It's spectacular. Yeah. Awesome. Just keep going, man. It looks great. Awesome. So when you get a situation where you've got servers all over the place and connections to this and that database and all that sort of jazz. What you've got might look like this on the surface, but if it works, you know, it works. I mean, we've all had situations where we, um, we have something like this that we have to support and maybe it looks a little neater, maybe it doesn't. Um, the problem that we have is that we don't know when this thing is not working unless the phone melts. And that's really not a good way to find out about problems and customers don't really think it's a good way to find out about problems either. And um, for a long time, um, uh, our main API server, that was kind of how we found out was the tickets would just all of a sudden explode. And so we, we had to find a better way to deal with that. So that required special tools. I don't know where this comes from, but I need this knife because it's got like seven different kinds of scissors on it and a tuning fork and a hatchet, but anyway. So we started off with logs. Um, you know, we did the debug logs uh, from debug view and from other places. And, um, you know, they're really useful. Uh, the problem is they just keep coming and they come from SQL, they come from our web servers, they come from maybe our applications that are putting out debug view logs. And you end up with a situation like, I have, uh, this is one from one of our web servers. There's nine log files there. And there are log files from, a, from uh, you know, one per day. And they're not very big. But it's not really very easy to search across them. Even, even with KSS, it's just, it's just not an ideal situation. And to do so, I still have to do it remotely. So I have to connect with RDP and pull it up and search it. And, and it, it just, to me, it just seemed really, it, it got to be, where I was just like, uh. and then I started trying to deal with situations where I have a database server somewhere and I have this web server here and I've got some other API server somewhere else and they're all involved in the problem. So I've got logs on three different machines and it just became a nightmare to try to, to debug. And when you look a little deeper, you find out that there's like a million of these things. There's logs from everywhere. Now we've got two different Postgres servers and, and a SQL server and a test SQL server and a test Postgres server and, and uh, I don't know, 10 websites and three API servers. And before long, you just lose your mind. Um, you know, and you can't, do, you can't do diagnosis when you're looking around at all these different logs at the same time. And these are all actually samples of our, of our logs. And so it just, it kind of makes you crazy and I'm not really about crazy. And this is really the problem with logs is that it just keeps going. Because every time you add a server, every time you add a SQL instance, 
uh, or every time you add a new API server or you start using AWS Lambda or whatever, you just get more logs and more logs and more logs. And pretty soon you look like this guy. And now, John, you understand why I said it was a hat tip to you in here. So I, I try to find a solution. I, I really this. appreciate this slide. By the way. <laughs> I had a little fun with this. So, yeah. So I, I, I just needed a solution to this because I just had too many logs in it. And, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do is actually work myself out of this job that I've got. Uh, not really a job, but it's out of the role that I've got. And um, I need to replace myself. And I have to, I can't turn over something that makes you look like that guy with that look on his face. You know, you, you can't hire somebody into a position. At least I don't want to hire somebody into a position. And that's the look on their face, uh, you know, when they come in in the morning. So, Mark, did you create yeah. a log? Did you create a log of your logs? It started off that way. Uh -huh. And and that's kind of what, what this slide actually refers to is that that was the first thing I thought. I was like, okay, I'm going to put all these logs in one place in a central log, and I'm going to figure out a way to, to be able to query them or search them better or something. And um, that was a good idea and a bad idea. Uh, it, was a, it was a good idea because it led me to something that we're going to talk about here in a little bit um, that helps me deal with this. But it was a bad idea because when you have 10 different servers sending 10 different structures of logs to the same place, it looks like you had your five-year-old make a, a three-course dinner on one plate. It's kind of a mess. It's kind of like that other screen that we saw just a second ago. And so we've always had dashboards. They're, they're another solution to this problem. Um, but the thing about dashboards, even though I really like them, um, they're great for, for state review. They're great for, for being able to glance at them and see everything's cool or everything's not cool. But they don't really fix the problem. And unless they're right in your face, it's really easy to forget to look at them. I know Arnold and I have talked about having a separate monitor on our desk that it, the only function of that monitor is to have a dashboard on it. Um, I haven't done that yet. Have you done that yet, Arnold? I'll stay quiet. <laughs> okay. So Arnold's thinking about it. And so we started doing monitoring. Um, started doing this on these on the API server in particular. Um, our API server, or at least the first one, was a license management server. So our apps call home to get a license to use. Um, we use a, a floating seat license. So uh, an engineering firm might have 200 engineers, but they might only have 20 licenses. And um, so our license just floats from seat to seat, and whoever has the app open, uh, if there's any seats available, then, then they consume a seat uh, until they close it, and then the seat goes back to the pool. And um, that all works fine, but occasionally network things happen, databases get tired, um, something causes something to fall over. And so I had set up a, a website monitor that would tell me uh, when the API server was down. And um, Arnold, you and I talked about this two years ago, as a matter of fact. Um, I would get a text message from this thing because it would, it would test once a minute to see if the server was up, which was great at first, except that when the server wasn't up, it wasn't great because I might be, for example, in the Portland Science Center with my kids and my phone would beep and it's 10 o'clock in the morning on a Friday. And it's like, honey, I got to go to the car. And so I got to well, actually, what I have to do is I have to go outside at the science center where I can actually get a cell connection and RDP into a server from, from my phone, which, you know, we've all probably had to do and no one of us really like it. And I know Arnold has a story about this as well that he yeah. doesn't really want to relive either. No. <laughs> and not a pretty well, sight. I will. Well, at least you had a monitor, okay? My monitor was a ton of email hitting me in the middle of being in, sitting there with my wife watching Hamilton that we spent a ton of money on before halftime. What Ooh. a nightmare. Yeah, and you know, that these, those are the lessons that we learn that, that tell us that we need to do something different than what we're doing. 
because I suspect that Mama really didn't like the fact that you had to leave. But uh, anyway, the, the thing about this and, and this the campfire image there is the, the one that that really got me after the Portland thing is that, you know, it's it's great. I mean, it, it's truly great that I know when the system needs some assistance. It's not great that the system needs assistance. And so that that moved me on, on and um, I set up something that would that would not only check the server, but would restart it if it noticed that conditions were occurring that um, that would cause this kind of downtime. And so, it, you know, there's there's a little app that does a service check using self-service. And, and by the way, this is going to be a commercial for Capesoft, by the way. And um, it uh, uses some NetTalk web client to see if the server's responding. And like, if it's not responding on the same machine, that's really not good. Uh, so it'll just kill the service one way or another, even if it has to use task kill to do it and, um, and restart it. And that's, that's been working pretty well um, for, oh, I don't know, 10 years maybe. Um, but it's just not enough, um, especially when you start getting lots of stuff. Um, I was in an environment um, a few years ago where we had a pretty robust test system. Um, there was automated app testing. Uh, I mean, like, I don't know, 100,000 function points or so uh, that every time you made a build, it would create an installer and build the help and put all the pieces together and upload the file and, and upload the installer and send the installer to the test system and test systems would run and go through all this stuff. And that was absolutely super cool if you like to sleep. And I kind of like to sleep. Um, but it was also super expensive. Um, it required anywhere from one to three dedicated devs just trying to catch up with the applications and, and test the right things and test the right things on different operating systems and test new installs versus update installs. And, and you know, and then another 95,000 function points of the app. Uh, so these systems are really great. And um, I mean that that company would have had serious problems without that without that test uh, situation in place. But not all of us can afford the time or the money to do that because it, I mean it literally would take any of us, at least a full time person, dedicated to that to build something like that. Um, and I'm talking about UI automated UI testing uh, is what was uh, so time consuming. But you know, test systems in general are, are are pretty cool and pretty useful. And you know, it's easier to do that when you're you're running an API. You can you can set up something to run tests and and all that. Um, on the on the UI side, I think there's diminishing returns because it's just it's just so expensive. Um, but if you can afford it, it uh, it's definitely worth it. But you know me, I still wanted more. And then I started thinking about Scotty. And it was kind of funny. I was I was thinking about, you know, when I had RDP in one of these machines, I kind of felt like him when he goes crawling into this tunnel somewhere in the starship. And I'm thinking, well, you know, it's 2020. I shouldn't be having to crawl around in tunnels. And then I thought, well, geez, poor Scotty. He's in like year 2300 and something, depending on who you ask. And he's still having to crawl around in tunnels and stick a wrench in a hole and try to avoid shocking himself. I mean, if you've seen any of these episodes, he always has some thing where he has to do something relatively dangerous. And I thought, you know, something's not right about that because he shouldn't have to do that in that day and age. And even in this day and age, if we can avoid it, it'd be nice. And then I started talk, thinking about this guy that I'm trying to hire. And I started thinking about, okay, what's going to happen when this guy goes on vacation? All this is going to fall back on me. And then I started thinking about how other people feel when I'm on vacation. And they're probably scared to death that some of this stuff is going to break. And, in, you know, the reality is my phone's going to ding because it's just what it does. 
but it still got me thinking about trying to insulate the success of the company and my role and our systems from each other in some way so that you know they can live happily ever after and all of that and so i think some of the chance to use a star trek picture so what we do now is is are these three things i mean there are maybe some other things we do too but we turn debug on and we try to reproduce the problem and that's great unless you're in mountain time and the person having the problem is in Easter time and they had it two hours ago and you didn't have logs running or you need them to send you a database on that. We still, um, our databases are all in house, but our, we have still use TPS files. You know, it's like, you ever notice how when you escape something and you draw a line in the sand, you say, I am never going to use TPS files again. Then you end up doing something that requires you ended up using them again. So our, our project files are separate TPS files. So if you have five engineering projects, you probably have five TPS files. Uh, so the upside is they're not shared. The downside is we still have TPS files. So occasionally when there's a problem with them, somebody has to send them to us. And that's kind of one of these, you know, one of these things on the list, or we write it down and fax it to somebody, or we send it over on a dinosaur, or they email it to us, or they, you know, they send us a screenshot or whatever. Um, this was a reasonable way to debug problems when we were using Clarion 4. And the more I thought about this, the more I thought, you know, we've, we've really improved since Clarion 4, but we really haven't improved our ability to diagnose stuff all that much since Clarion 4 other than debug view. So I wanted more. And then I was, uh, digging around to find, to find some good quotes on this. Now we found one that really fit, and that was this one here. Resilient systems build in fail safe so that when something breaks down, the next step to recover is obvious. Make your habit a resilient system. And I like to think that, the, at least on the API server side, is that the API servers that now will restart themselves, and I don't have to deal with that, um, that they're resilient and to some at some level, they they self repair. I don't have them set up to actually reboot the VM itself. Um, that wouldn't be difficult to do, but I just haven't needed to do it. But I started thinking about how how I was going to get to this next place I wanted to get to, and the, the things that came up when I started looking around were the three things listed there: instrumentation, self repair, and observability. Um, instrumentation just is you know today's buzzword or whatever for um, sending metrics home and not necessarily metrics to spy on your users but metrics just so that your apps inform you how things are going and observability is kind of a well it's more a more modern buzzword i would say or a more recent buzzword it's kind of a in that order of instrumentation in, in that order uh, um, no, I would actually put self repair first. Um, cause really I, the number of times that I have to RDP into a server per year has dropped by 99% at least. And self repair is all about that. Uh, if I had added instrumentation or observability 10 years ago, it would have helped me find problems and it it would help me see trends that I wouldn't ordinarily have been able to see. But man, there is nothing like when you're somewhere with your family and you get the text saying the server's down and you blow it off because four minutes later, you know, you're going to get another text that says the server's back up and all that was automatic. That's really nice. And you get to the point where you, you depend on that. And so I haven't had to had it. Uh, to RDP into one of these servers to fix them in a, in a very long time. And I really like it that way. I love self healing. And then uh, I found this quote just, yeah, yeah. Self healing is another, another word for it. Um, this consumption economics book, if you uh, find the time to read a book, it's a good book to read, especially if you're in the software or SaaS business. Uh, it's just a, it's just a really great read. Um, this is one of the quotes that I took out of it. And it's just talking about, why we instrument an app 
Uh, it doesn't really, it doesn't ever really talk about in here that we do it so that we can spy on people and see what they're doing. It's so that we can learn how they're doing, how they're using the app, what they're having problems with, and things of that nature so that we can make the app better. Um, and that's one of the things that while we haven't used instrumentation to do that, um, we put a lot of effort into eliminating the need for support in our apps. Uh, we have, I don't know, north of 10,000 users. I'll just put it that way. And we have one support guy and he doesn't even work on support full time. And that doesn't happen by accident. Uh, it was intentional. I didn't have too much to do with it actually, but um, it's a very intentional act. And um, yeah, maybe it was done for lifestyle reasons, but it doesn't really matter uh, necessarily why. It's just nice. Uh, not to have a, a nine-person support team because I've had that too, and uh, this is better. But anyway, um, instrumentation is a really useful thing uh, if you can get your hands on it. So this kind of goes over, um, you know, a little bit about what I talked about as far as the steps that I've gone through in this monitoring, self-healing instrumentation process uh, since 2006. Um, that's when I started working on this, on this stuff. And I, I went um, full-time in this gig in 2017. And everything here just kind of repeats what I've already talked about, but I didn't want to forget about it. And then, so this observability thing came up and I've, I've got some friends that are um, local tech people that are, you know, a third of my, well, I'm not a third of my age, two thirds of my age. And, you know, so they're working for what I would call normal SaaS companies. Um, it's all, you know, all web-based stuff and, and you know, all the buzzwordy stuff. And, and um, they've been talking about observability for a while because they have lots of servers and they're using, you know, containers or whatever. And if you've got 42 containers, it's impossible to manage unless you've got some kind of automation in place. And so that's what they're doing. Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of what part of what the DevOps thing is all about is managing those kinds of environments. So while what I'm doing today is, is all right, I, I, again, I just, I wanted to be able to give this next person something better. And so I started digging into this observability thing and I found this really nice hand-drawn thing. This uh, Cindy Sitaran, um, she talks about and uh, writes about observability quite a bit. And she just put this hand-drawn thing together that was a really nice way of explaining the difference between testing and monitoring and observability. And um, it's not that, e that any of those three things are, are bad. It's just that all three of them together are really nice. And um, just that I just found it a really nice uh, explanation diagram. But she mentions in there that, you know, there's metrics and there's, log, there's logs and there's tracing. And sometimes we kind of use those all interchangeably. Um, in the observability world, metrics is a, point, a, a measurement in a point in time of something, you know, RAM usage or whatever. Um, whereas a trace, you know, we use debug view for that, you know, pretty often we'll, we'll have a whole bunch of of ODS statements in a in an app, and it'll spit out a trace of what something, what something, what process did, and what the steps were all along the way, so that we could figure out what happened that wasn't supposed to happen. And then logging tends to be more about and all the time. This is what I'm doing. 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 This is what happened. Uh, you know, like a database log. You know, it doesn't it doesn't get specific and just log a particular thing it pretty much just logs everything it's doing and the great thing about that is it's kind of like a time machine you can go back and look at the log from yesterday and see something that happened that you can't possibly observe today um, which is useful and then all three of these things together um, even if they're combined just two of them are combined with each other or all three of them are combined um, all those combinations are useful at some point but it's difficult to do that with debug view by itself. And 
this was kind of when I when I saw this diagram compared with with the other one, but and looked at them hard and thought about them. This is really what I was looking for. And this kind of summarizes um, that. You know, I was I was looking for a better way to look at all of our logs and traces and metrics because we've got all three, and um, there's some stuff that I don't have too much visibility into. Not because it's not being logged, it's just that, you know, it's just one more thing to look at. And I have to, you know, like for example, the Postgres logs. You know, Postgres logs have been cranking away for years, but I gotta go connect to AWS and then I gotta go log into the right place and I gotta go look at them and then I don't have any context for anything else that's going on. Um, which sometimes is not necessary, but sometimes it is. And I, I was just, I just want stuff, okay? So this is kind of where I was going is I also, I just wanted all these things to be in a nice, neat place where I could get to them when I needed to and where this other person could do the same because it would just be a whole lot better learning environment. So then I had to think about how I was going to get this process started. And um, the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to stop RDPing into a server to look at the RDP or to look at the ODS log, but I wanted 24 by seven coverage of the ODS logs, which I didn't have because I couldn't leave debug view open. And um, I mean, I know I can, I can, there's settings in debug view where, or in um, ultimate debug, where you can just tell it to log to a file, but I still have to transfer that file or, or RDP into that machine and look at that file. And that just wasn't what I wanted. Um, I wanted something more centralized. So I, I started looking around and I found this, this honeycomb tool. And this was kind of an early prototype of one of the server's logs. This is uh, our API server. And the log that it puts out is, I wouldn't exactly call it sophisticated, um, but it's the data that I need if I'm trying to figure out something. And so this was the initial prototype of I don't want to have to RDP to look at the log anymore and um, this is what I got ah, I need coffee so um, that was encouraging because if I could do it for one then I could do it for four or 20 or whatever and so I started off by putting this logging into um, into all of our API servers and Sorry, my Alex is talking to me. And we're back. So um, that was encouraging. I now had a place where I could go look at all the logs. And we're going to go into this a little bit more in a bit. But I, I just wanted to show you what the what the early stage of this looks like. And um, Kind of nice because you can, you know, the times come in as UTC because all the servers are UTC, but it's not always easy just to do that math in your head. Um, so you can just click on that little doodad right there and it'll switch the time from local and local for you where you're logged in uh, to UTC and back and forth. So that can be kind of handy. Um, and I, I do recommend that you put your, you leave your servers on UTC because it just makes life so much easier. But um, I still wanted more, so I wanted to see where I could where I could take this, and um, learned a few things along the way. Um, they don't have a, a Win32 DLL, so I didn't have an easy way to um, to write the logs out. Um, so what I did was I added some or uh, added a method to Ultimate Debug that conditionally calls um, a send to Honeycomb uh, method. And um, basically what that does is it just writes the log entry out to um, a command line and it runs this Python script. And that was great, worked perfectly, except that it ran constantly because some of these servers put out a lot of ODS um, logs. And what happened was um, I would have well, if you opened up the server and RDP and watched it, you would just have these little black boxes popping up constantly. It was like a pinball machine or whack-a-mole or something. 
and they were popping up to run the Python script and then going away, which was great. They were doing what they were supposed to do, but I looked at the CPU and um, the CPU was going nuts because the Microsoft uh, antivirus was scanning every single time to see what was going on. And that wasn't good. So I ended up having to build a class. And um, I mean, the upside was I had, I had access to all this stuff now and had it remote and had it all in one place and could query it and refine it and say, just show me the, some of the stuff in the last two hours or show me the stuff in the last 10 minutes. And um, that was great. But the initial attempt was a little crude. Um, you know, when, you, when you have the whack-a-mole thing going on, it's not very good. So then I moved on to metrics after I got, got that resolved. And this was a, this was a super uh, early crude thing uh, for a new sync that we're doing. We're changing our licensing um, so that um, what well, currently we have installed licenses and we have cloud licenses. And we're moving to a model where we have licenses. So we don't really care if you use the installed version or the cloud version, or if you swap back and forth six times a day, um, you can just, you can use as many seats as you have, and we don't care where the seats are used. And we needed some additional metrics to deal with that. And um, we also have to sync files because of that, which became a really interesting project to sync files between installed users and try to figure out a way to not have to deal with firewall problems all over the place and um, process it the right way and get it to S3 where the cloud and apps can get to it and go back and forth. That was fun. Um, so I wanted some metrics in here so I could make sure that this thing was performing, the sync process was performing right. And um, this, uh, this upper screen here shows the raw data for the log that was being produced at the time. And then the bottom one is a, um, if you see, we see the far left, right here, I guess I should use the mouse, uh, where it says visualized count. Um, you can put all kinds of stuff in here to filter things and group them and so forth. But the visualized thing is kind of cool because when you look at this, you can't really see how fast things are going. And you can just use that count thing and it produces this graph from the same data. I mean, just instantly basically. And um, it'll show you, you know, how the how the volume is, at least that's what this this data is telling us is, is what the volume of sinks is. So it was a good way for me to um, to figure out how things were going and how I was gonna be able to easily keep track of volume so that I know, you know, if I need to adjust the, the maximums on the server, if I need to adjust the server size and, uh, and just what the time frames are for all these things. Because when you see one of the things in here is the elapsed time of the transfer and that that's right there and that's in seconds. Um, so I needed a way to keep track of all that as well. And that, that provoked me to, to take an early shot at the metrics. So I was feeling a little bit better about this. I had, I had a way to log, I had a way to collect metrics. I had a way to do it that wasn't going to drive the antivirus crazy on the server. And then I added some logging to our API server. And uh, then I added some, or I added some metrics to it. Actually, this is the, the metric side of it. I don't know if you can see that too well, but basically what it's showing is there's a timestamp and then there's the computer name of the person who is activating a seat and there's their company number. And then there's their, Windows login name and this manual thing is that if, if we manually activate them from our CRM, that would be a one. And I looked at that and what immediately jumped out at me that was that there were a few people that they were showing up time after time consecutively, which tells me that they're having some sort of problem with, uh, with their activation process and it's probably firewall. Um, sometimes it's proxy, sometimes it's ad blocker, sometimes it's, yeah, it, that goes on for a while. But, um, but the thing that stuck out to me that I'd never really considered was, you know, it'd be nice if we had a way to tell if somebody had tried to activate five times in, uh, you know, two minutes, one minute. Actually, in this case, I think it's multiple API calls, but um, it struck me that if we had a way to detect that somebody had tried and failed to activate, 
twice or three times or something like that, that we could notify support and they could preemptively contact that person before they get grumpy and whatever because they can't get connected or because they can't um, activate their seat. And so that was kind of a an aha moment for the power of this kind of data and for the power to the ability to to just glance at this data and see how I can improve the customer experience. Um, so that was kind of a nice little two by four to the forehead um, when I saw this because it gave me a whole bunch of ideas. And hopefully, if you do something like this, you'll you'll kind of your, yours will be different, but you get the same kind of ideas. And um, so I did a little more of this activity tracing on these. Uh, these are the activations. So this is license uh, counts on our older server. And that means people who haven't updated to a more recent version in two years. So they're on the server that's, Bruce, this is the version four NetTalk server. <laughs> it's, not, it's not version four anymore, but that's where it started. Um, so there's still a fair number of people that in any particular one minute period um, you know, there's there's still 20 people a minute at peak or thereabouts, 18 to 20. Um, so we still got some people that we need to get off of old builds. And, um, you know, that's that's better for them and it's better for us. And eventually someday I can put a fork in the server. But um, seeing the peak times was was nice and seeing the volume, uh, the per minute volume is was nice. And it's great for coming back later and seeing how this has been affected by our our efforts to get people to to update and i mean we do things like if they every 60 days if if they activate the license on a build that's not reasonably current we actually send them an email with a list of all the computers that activated on an old build and we do that every 60 days um, and that that actually helped a whole lot um, and that's all automatic so it's one less thing for me to actually have to do so, um, like I said, I wrote a class and and um, put together some thing, uh, some stuff like I've been showing you in production. And so, I wanted to show you how simple this is to add. So I'm gonna have to change screens here. So, let's. I don't want to make another person a presenter. I want to do this. Yes. Okay, I need some administrative help here. I need to change to a different screen. Um, okay, so did you so get out of the uh, a different screen on the same machine? Different yeah. machine, right? Different different screen, same machine. Okay, so you just want to. Um, get out and share, then when you're sharing, uh, show the screen, it'll give you choices of which screen to show. And it'll-, it'll Yeah, it's like, just going back to the same one now, um, for some reason. It, yeah, just don't click on, click the down arrow, go to, go. there should be a down arrow below the share your screen. Oh, duh, I was clicking a different one. Okay, so that, There we go. Okay, you should see a, a VM. Interesting. We see a honeycomb. Workstation right there. Okay, yep. great. Okay, I love it when a plan comes together. So this is the, the honeycomb tool. And the really cool part about this is that it's built for really big SaaS companies like normal big SaaS companies. And so oh, their like free plan company. includes, <laughs> right, <laughs> <laughs> this, their free plan includes two or excuse me, 20 million events per month. I don't use that many. You probably don't use that many either. So if I go to the usage page here, um, they have this burst thing. This is so cool. So this is what I've been using so far. So under the line, if I average under the line the whole month, it's free. But they have this cool thing called burst protection. And so if your API goes nuts, like mine did on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, because I added some stuff, they just say, oh, you must have screwed up. So we're not gonna bill you for any of that. So those don't even count towards my quota for the month. 
I thought that was like a super cool way to think about the user and, um, but also protect, you know, protect them and protect us uh, at the same time. So that was just kind of a sidebar, but um, anyway, yeah, so you get is, 20. That is really cool. That That's something to think about in our own apps, right? So yeah, for sure. I, like I, was, I was, I was, uh, I was really impressed with that because they sent me an email and they said, Hey, you've activated burst protection because you know, your systems have gone nuts and you get three of these event per, events per month. So um, if I do it the next, after the next one, then I'll start getting billed, but the billing changes at the end of the month. And now that I figured out what I did wrong on Tuesday and Wednesday, then I'm all good. Um, so still, I, you know, after using this in an increasing fashion all month, I've still only used a third of my month or a third of my quota. So that's, uh, that's kind of cool. So, I mean, it's, you could I make mean, clearly, you could create 20 million events in a month, but you probably don't need to. Um, so these are all the different data sets. You've actually got them in different data sets and um, it's a Clarion Live one here somewhere. Yeah, there it is. And there's nothing in it yet. So I created this this morning and um, there's nothing in it. And when you when you create the data set, actually, let me create another one here so you see what this looks like. Um, you can tell it how you're gonna interface with it. So there's like all the standard stuff. And then you can tell it that you wanna point, you can actually point your ADVS logs or your Azure logs or your Postgres logs to this. And they have a collector that runs it just automatically ingests all this stuff. Uh, that wait, volume... wait, wait, where's Clarion? How, how can I use this? <laughs> yeah, there's there's no Win32 uh, thing in it. There is a uh, command line. There is a command line thing in here. Uh -huh. It's written in Go. And I just didn't want to, pardon the pun, I didn't want to go there. Um, I kind of settled on Python, and while it was nice that they had a command line way to do this, I started digging around and go, and I was just like, this looks too much like something I don't want to do. Um, it just seemed difficult, but, um, and there's a whole bunch of other integrations with all kinds of open source stuff. Um, there's .NET there. Um, so you can connect your, your databases directly to it. You can connect your, you know, your Apache or your Amazon or whatever. Um, so there's, you know, cool. like says, yeah, your flat files, key by key values, JSON, and the JSON is what I'm using, but I'm using the Python interface to do that. So, um, and you can use curl. So that actually might be the easiest way uh, if you don't use Python or something like that with, um, with Clarion is to use that because there's that, um, there's that uh, curl interface. Well, I, Mike Douglas has one. And I think that the, the um, trying to think of the guy. English guy has the interface to curl. Um, so you could use his as well. But anyway, it's it's not terribly difficult to get um, to get the data in there. But I just kind of wanted to show you some of kind of the basics on this and, and most importantly show that you know 20 million events pretty much covers all of us. <laughs> so um, so I wrote this class. Uh, would help if I had already pulled that up. Uh, let's see here. And um, I don't want to go reading through all this stuff, but basically, I wanted to show you that it's um, uh, there's methods in here for setting the API key and setting the data sets so that you don't have that information in your repo. And um, the metrics, the metrics are really simple. You you tell it what you're going to send by giving it a CSV string of headings, like column headings in Excel. And then you give it um, the metrics in the same way. You send the metrics just in a comma delimited thing, and then it massages them into the format that the Python interface needs. And that's what all this stuff is. And here, let me make Bruce happy. Um, Look, it's a subclass of string theory because I'm lazy. <laughs> I said it was a, it was a commercial for Capesoft, so there you go. So anyway, it's it's a um, it's a pretty simple class. It's out on um, it's uh, on GitHub right here. Happy to to have you use it. Happy to have you send me pull requests if you make an improvement to it. Um, I'm going to show you how to call it here in a second, but. Let me show 
so these two scripts, these two Python scripts, they basically start off as the examples that they give. And you see there's not much to them. That's the whole metric script right there. And it basically just reads the CSV file that you send it and it pushes it to Honeycomb. And they have this thing in there where they, they've got all the caching and throttling built in to their stuff. So when you run this script, it might run for two seconds and it might run for 30 because if you send it a, you know, a huge pile of data, it's not going to bury your connection. So it'll, it'll throttle how it sends the data, uh, which is, uh, which is kind of nice. And then the log, the log script is equally simple, basically the same. It's just a little bit of difference in how the, this is handled right here, how the parsing is handled. And, um, so you call that script. No, with run, I don't, you know, nothing more fancy than that. Um, class has got some flushing in, in it so that it will, it will only run the Python script every 30 seconds or 15 seconds or whatever amount of time that you want to, um, uh, how many times you want that little whack-a-mole to cast to pop up. Um, I put that in there because I didn't want it to run. And, uh, you know, every, every time an ODS call was made, um, most of them I've got set to 30 seconds. So that seems to be a good balance between, I wanna see the information promptly, but I don't want to drive the machine crazy by running a Python script every half second. Um, so anyway, that worked out well. Now Bruce can see why I was asking him about RFC 3339 a couple of weeks ago, uh, because that's the date uh, format that, that, that this thing needs. So. This is really not very exciting at all uh, from a code perspective. There's a bunch of comments in here, and this is this is how it's packaging the log and putting that cutely formatted timestamp in there. Uh, that's not really very exciting. So this is more of the, well, if there's anything exciting in here, it would be that it's really simple to call. Um, again, I put this in here this way so that you can put a source repo out and not have your API key um, published out on GitHub, which is not a good place to, to put that kind of stuff. Um, they actually do scan for that and they will email you if you, if they, if their code, they've got some kind of security thing that they run on all repos or all public repos. And if they see something that looks like an API call, they'll email you and say, Hey, you got an, you got an, a, an API key in this public repo. Do you really want to do that? Um, which is kind of cool. So, Anyway, I set the API key that I get in from the command line. I set the data set. In this case, I've got simple data here. I've got a date, I've got a time, and I've got a sales figure. And that was just a, the closest thing to a simple idea just to, to kind of show proof of concept. Um, so this is the Clarion date, obviously. And um, I think I'm just calculating this is eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock and uh, time-wise, and then a sales number. And um, so that gets passed that, uh, to that method and it'll get pushed to Honeycomb. And then I got a couple of log entries here uh, doing the same kind of thing. And so that's, that's really all you have to do. What I did in, um, in Ultimate Debug, um, I've, I've actually got ODS calls in it in a number of different classes, um, which is kind of stupid, but it's just kind of how it is. Um, in ultimate debug, I added a method just that just says send the honeycomb. And I call that from the method that actually does the ODS call. So it was relatively simple to turn that on and turn that off if I wanted to and just call from there. So it was a really minor change. Um, so John, if you want that, I can, I can give that to you. And um, that's that's really all there is to, to code again. I mean, this is a really simple example, but what I do, um, for example, when I add the metrics, when there's a, a function in an application that I want, like this, like that sync, that file sync thing, when a file sync starts and a file sync ends, then I, you know, I keep track of the start time for the sync. And then when the sync time, then when the sync ends, I subtract the difference and then I just send the file name and the computer name and the login name and and how long it took and that kind of stuff and i use the add metrics call to do that and that's how that showed up uh in that screenshot uh well you can't see that because i'm not showing the powerpoint anymore um in that powerpoint uh, slide so um mark yeah 
So are you like embedding just the class calls in, in um, important places in your program so when they hit that, it reports back? Yep, that's exactly what happens. Okay. So this is, this is what the test app does to call it. Um, in, your, in your program, you just need to call these API calls. And actually, um, you'll notice that there's no calls in here to say flush or send to honeycomb or any of that kind of stuff. The class keeps track of that and it monitors how big the log gets before it goes over the edge of a string theory um, object. And it'll, it'll call honeycomb and say, here's the log. And then it'll flush that log and it'll start another one. And it does the same for the metrics. So it, you never have to think about sending it. You just have to use, the, use these, add met, uh, these two add methods to uh, to send the data over to it and the class takes care of it and when your app closes there's a there's a thing in the destructor to flush at the end so that way you don't lose data when your app closes so that's um that kind of kept it simple which is what i was trying to get to and so oh i need to run this so the tester just uses the api key and um, you say there's windows opened up and went away that probably something that could be improved that they probably needs to use. Um, gee, what tool would I use to run a command and not have the window pop up? Maybe that'd be odd job. So anyway, I don't know how many people have odd jobs. So I didn't put that in this class just because of that. But if you have odd job, it'd be super simple to do that. And I'll probably add that in there, maybe cop commit, comment it out or something. Um, so that way, you can uh, not have that little pop-up thing. It doesn't bother me because I see it on servers, uh, all right? Because it only happens for us on servers. But um, you probably wouldn't want that happen on the desktop. So we've got some data. Um, I don't have any of these things filled in because I just want to see the raw data. So I hit the run query button, and the data hasn't gotten there yet. Uh, hopefully, that's the right. Did I use the right query mod? Yeah, that's right. Okay, well that'll eventually show up here. Um, that's one of the things about the free account is there is a there there is a little bit of latency at times in the free account, uh, so sometimes you have to wait a little bit. Normally, not so much during the day. I find that the latency actually shows up in the middle of the night uh, when people's um, when people heavy batch processes are running or something. Um, so this just shows the number of, what is this? Oh, this is metric dumps from the um, version two activation server. Um, not terribly useful here, but um, if I get rid of the count, I'll stop it. If I get rid of the count and run, then I can see the raw data. And that shows the, um, get rid of that. That shows the people who are logged in, well, like in the last few seconds, and tried to activate their machine. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's really helpful for me to go to be able to see this stuff, um, and for all of these servers, uh, for there's just different functions. I've got them split out here because some of these I just don't want to mix. These are clearly all related to license management, and these are related to renewal emails that go out. And, um, oh, you know what? I was doing a metrics call. Let's see if there's anything here. Ha, there is. Helps when you go to the right place. No, there isn't. So what did I do wrong? All right, well, it'll get there eventually. So um, anyway, that's basically what I came up with. Like I said, this is very early. I just finished building this in the last couple of weeks. And um, what it's allowed me to do is just keep a, a really, it's just an easy way to keep track of what's going on. This is a service that runs all the time that, um, and, and this is the one that went berserk the other day and was writing a whole bunch of stuff. And now you can see that I've got it. It was doing this like every three seconds, uh, the spike, and that added up a little too fast. So now it, it sends out like every 20 minutes or something. And, um, but there's just a lot of important information in here when I need to, to 
look for a problem and I don't have to RDP. I leave this, this tab open all day long. Um, I can just roll in here and, and see what's going on. Um, let's see here. I don't know why this didn't work, but it's not really a good time to do diagnosis and it doesn't really matter. Um, Cause that's really just super easy to do. And if you have any questions about it, uh, the Skype chat would be a good place to, um, to put those in. Uh, uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, anyway, as you can see, I've got them broken up by kind of functional areas. Um, I haven't done any database logs in here yet because I just don't ever look at them. I just don't ever need to. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to use up. Um, I'm not going to use up my vast 20 million log entries with 37 million lines of uh, Postgres log that I don't need to see. Um, so, so far, stuff that I've put in here just relates to our apps or our servers. And um, anyway, that's, uh, that's the solution I ended up with. And so far, I'm pretty happy with it. It's got a long way to go, especially on this uh, in this class. There's there's a bunch of different things that I can do in here, but but um, it's a, it's a decent start at least. And um, like I said, that's available to you. So let me go back to the slideshow. Yeah. So this is really cool where you can do stuff inside the app, but when you say you do the server, what do you use to grab server data? Um, um, one of these other collectors, um, go in here. When you go to, well, not new query, new data set. Um, when you go to new data set, uh -huh. and you go to show all integrations, if you scroll down here, like say you call this Arnold's, SQL Server. Then you can just roll down here and um, actually I don't even see SQL Server on here, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, I only see RD yet. No, I don't even see that. That was yeah, my question earlier. Where's MS SQL? Is that you know, it? I don't know. I have to, I guess we'd have to implement that with the, uh, I don't know, the command line or the JSON logs, probably the flat log files is what we would do for that. Would, um, would you use like PowerShell kind of thing to pump things out or what? Um, no, well, for the things that they support here, there's actually uh -huh. a, a tool that they give you to install on the server. Uh -huh. Now on RDS, I know that there's a way, well, clearly there's a way to do that because they've got them separated. So there must be some, I don't know if it's a Lambda thing or if it's something else. Um, like I said, I hadn't done this yet, but, um, there's got to be a way to, well, clearly there's something that they're attaching to the RDS version of MySQL and Postgres so that you can get the logs without having to manually install anything else. Mm -hmm. um, I know they've got, like all these things are some sort of tool that, um, or some sort of listener that installs and just automatically pulls in the logs from whatever thing that you're, you're logging for. Uh -huh. um, it is curious that SQL Server is not on there. Maybe that's maybe when you set it up. Collection. Maybe when you set it up, you didn't check it as one as something you use. It's possible, and the the other part of it is um, these two deals here. You can log with them, and so maybe you can redirect your SQL Server logs to CloudTrail or Cloud or CloudFront. Maybe CloudTrail. Um, anyway, I I think that's probably what the deal is, but. Um, yeah, that is a curious omission from this list. I'm gonna have to ask them about that because I can't imagine that there's nobody that's logging SQL Server. There's gotta be somebody that's figured out a way to do this. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in GitHub, um, things that people have written to their API. Um, maybe there's a SQL thing out there, but um, yeah, I just hadn't looked yet because I hadn't I hadn't thought about uh, hooking up our servers yet because I, I just, I never touch them. I mean, I've got, I've got a, a script that goes out and renames the, or not renames, but uh, purges the old backups every week and, you know, gets rid of the right weekly ones and the right monthly ones and the right quarterly ones and all that kind of stuff. But other than that, I just don't have to pay much attention to them. Uh, they just kind of run themselves. But um, 
if you're not using AWS for that or, or RDS for that, um, or what, you know, gives your equivalent of the uh, Google cloud equivalent, then you, um, you probably want to maybe route your log to it and see what it looks like. And I'm sure that'll work, but that, that would definitely be a good thing to put in there. Let me switch back to the slideshow. It really helps me figure out how to use it. Um, so why why did I do this? I mean, ultimately, it was it was to make life easier for this, this new guy. But when I make life easier for him, um, it makes life easier for me because I'm not having to. I'm still going to have to answer a bunch of questions, but I'm not going to have to answer near as many because this thing kind of provides a a place to start when you start investigating some kind of situation that's going on. And um, that's what I wanted for me, but I also wanted that for, for him. Um, and for me, if I get. Or her. In a situation where I need to, to investigate something myself, um, you know, because he's on vacation or, or whatever, but um there's, there's a, another reason for this, and that is that anytime you put something like this in place, if a buyer comes through the building after you've done this, it's way better than if a buyer comes through the building before you've done this. Um, because you know, they know that they're, that they're buying revenue, but they're also buying you know, where all the bodies are buried and they're buying everything that's in the closet that you haven't told them about or that they haven't asked about. And this is a great way of, of showing that you're, at least in my mind, just showing that you're organized and that you, um, you have a process for dealing with metrics and, and um, problem solving and, and all that kind of stuff. So that was another smaller reason why I did it. But this is the real reason. I don't know if you guys are going to be able to hear this or not. I don't hear it, but I can feel it. <laughs> well, that was the part of uh, Braveheart where, where Mel yells freedom right as he's dying. And so there you go. <laughs> that doesn't look good. <laughs> no, no. Well, I mean, he was dying after all. But the other part of it is, you know, when you you um, you see these things all the time, it's like, oh, wouldn't it be great to have my laptop on the beach? And my answer is, hell no. <laughs> I don't want to be sitting on my laptop or my iPad when I'm at the beach. I want to be at the beach. And um, so that's why I threw this in here because I. I I want these things to fix themselves if they can. And if they can't, I want to make it super easy to get to what I need to get to so that I can have something fixed or fix it myself or, or whatever. And let's see. Um, and a little thing here about self-repair. Um, I don't know. Well, I guess everybody here is probably old enough to remember this if they're in the US. Um, Self-repair is better than, or self-healing is, is better than monitoring because monitoring just tells you something's wrong. And this, this red area was without power for up to two days uh, back in 2003. And it's a great example of how a problem can cascade because it was like one, one monitor failed that led up to this. And when it started alarming, I actually didn't fail. It it started alarming, and the guy turned it off. And when he turned it off, something else failed, and then something else failed, and as like a single transmission line got overloaded because it was the first one. It, when it gets overloaded, I guess it gets hot, and so it sags, and then it sags into a tree, so it shorts. Well, what's an electric system going to do when something shorts? It's going to take that line out of the out of the, the grid. So it doesn't cause any more problems. Well, if that keeps happening, then you have all these sections of the grid that get taken off the grid. And all that does, all well, protects those systems. 
it just makes the whole rest of the system overloaded. And so that whole thing all count happened because the guy turned the monitor off at a, on one of the hottest days of the year in 2003, and these things just cascaded because there was nothing in place to automatically heal that problem and, and reroute that power. It just turns things off. That's just how those systems work. And so the scope of, of one of these little tiny problems um, can expand in a big hurry. This all happened in a few hours. And um, while it's, you know, the scope of what we do might not be quite that big, um, it's that big when we're dealing with it and it's in our world. And, um, and the story of that, of that whole power outage thing and how it happened is just insane. The whole, the whole timeline is a Wikipedia. And it's, uh, it's pretty interesting to see the recurring failures of monitoring and human error in that process that if there was some way to, to self-repair or, or brown people out automatically instead of having to do it manually or whatever, um, might've prevented all of that. But, um, you know, the same thing can happen to your system. You know, if, if our SQL servers get bogged down for some reason, then that slows down our activation server and our API servers and for long, something's going to break and it's a cascading break. And those are just a pain to, to figure out because you kind of, kind of become Clouseau or something. And this, um, you know, this requires intentional action to do this. Um, this book kind of talks about that. Um, don't necessarily need to read the book, but um, but it did. It, it gives you a good way to think about um, how these things happen and how you can avoid them. And and uh, there's another book that I was I was reading called Bex Sandpile, which is a little more nerdy than this upstream book is. Um, but it talks about all these kinds of failures um, and how they usually start with simple systems that were put together with other simple systems and they became a complex system and they were set up with some sort of cascading complexity failure model. And though because there, there isn't any healing in them most of the time, one little tiny thing, and it, it goes through all kinds of examples, but one little tiny thing tends to be the cause of these large failures that occur. So avoiding those would be nice. Um, I certainly would like to avoid them. Um, I mentioned this earlier. I just want to show the pricing of this so that you don't go there and get surprised or that you don't think it's going to be ridiculous. Um, 20 million events a month is um, pretty sweet, at least in, in our situation. Um, so hopefully that's, um, that's enough. Uh, for you guys to use, I mean, you know, it's not terribly expensive anyway, but uh, for the full, the full boat, but, um, um, but the free one is like a lot of capability uh, for no bucks. So that's kind of cool. And there's a whole bunch of resources here and I can paste these into the, to the, um, the Skype chat. Um, there's some reading about observability and a link to the, to GitHub and some other competitive tools to this. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's all, folks. Very impressive. Whoa, you hit all 35, like, in... <laughs> shocking. Shocking time. Well, does anybody have questions? I know I've been kind of, like, poking my questions in here and there. I, uh... I went on the um, Honeycomb IO site and I went to the chat and I asked them about SQL because if you go to that website and you look under um, uh, product or resources, I don't know where I did, and I look for databases, it didn't, yeah, products, and then I went to integration, other databases, and it only talked about those three, um, you know, MySQL, Mongo, DB, and Postgres. Hmm. No MS SQL. Well, it'll be interesting to see what kind of answer you get. Yeah, I'm waiting. Thanks. The team will reply as soon as they can. <laughs> but you know what? The, the the real strength is 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 you know everybody's passing JSON anyway. You know, and all this API stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. The name of the it's game um... is no JSON. 
Well, I mean, and you can, you know, you can pass some CSV. I just, I chose Jason because, you know, it's just where everything is, is, is much less where it's going. And um, it's just, it's well, and it's also so easy to deal with Jason and Python. So um, because I had to deal with Python anyway, I thought, well, I'll just do that. And that way I'll know what I'm doing because I've, I've done some other stuff with it. But um, and JavaScript anyway. and all that. Yeah, Jason yeah. is way to go. Yeah, for sure. So I I mean, you've got think plenty of options. options. But it is not. <laughs> As Bruce would tell you. Yeah. CSV definitely is not. Any questions? Let's see. I'm just in the process of cloning your repo now, Mark. Cool. You beat me to it. Oh, this is you. Okay. So, any questions, anybody? So, um, so why did you pick Honeycomb? Because of the price, or because um, some reviews, or? Um, you know, I didn't even discover the price until after the fact. I figured, you know, I knew they had a free plan, and they actually changed the free plan this summer while I was starting to work on this, and it's actually a lot better than it was. Um. I don't know if they did that because of COVID or because they were trying to get more people in the door. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. But, uh, me, yeah. You know, because most of their customers, you know, probably all of their paying customers are just much bigger companies than most of ours are uh, from a, from a server perspective. You know, if they've got a web server, you know, they've got 20 or a hundred or whatever, you know, that is, and they're going to hit 20 million events. No problem at all. Yeah. Uh, hmm. But for the kind of uses that we have, um, it was just kind of a perfect fit. Because um, if I'm, you know, if I'm generating 600 events, 600,000 events a day, it's probably because I've done something wrong, like Tuesday. And um, and all I did Tuesday was I was just writing out a whole bunch of spurious entries that I didn't need to write out. And so I just went in and and stopped writing those out. I've actually put a a thing in there where it can turn it on and off. And um, so I just use that for stuff that I would want to see if I was debugging interactively, but that I just really don't care about, you know, the other 23 hours of the day um, if I'm logging. And so that got the volume back down to a reasonable amount and actually made the log a lot easier to look at. So yeah, anyhow, that was, um, that's where it's gotten so far. Like I said, I just, I just got started on this, oh, I don't know, a month and a half ago or something like that. And um, just been working on it as I had time, but um, uh, so far, at least, it's I've been I've been pleased with what I've gotten out of it and what it's kept me from having to do. Well, if nothing else, just the fact that it makes it easier to access the logs, you know, yep. that in and of itself is is a a, de a perfect deal right there. And then the fact that all that other neat stuff happens along with it is a, is a good thing. So. Yeah, I was uh, I was not upset that I was thinking to myself I would probably not ever have to RDP into another machine from my phone to look at a log again. Oh yeah, um, and, then, and it's not it's, <laughs> and of course it happens to us all. You know, I can remember coaching a a, a kid's soccer team one day, and suddenly you know, we're in the middle of a big game, and suddenly bang, Mike, we have to have you look at this now. And I'm going, oh god, <laughs> yeah, so and so. <laughs> Uh, it, it's definitely something that happens more often than we want, and uh, uh, the, the more we can make that easy to handle, uh, the better. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So anyway, I hope that uh, I hope that's useful, and uh, I mean it has been for me so far, and hopefully it'll get more useful over the years between um, all of us working on it. Well, thank you, Mark. It's uh, it's exceptionally cool, and, uh, and your good. slides look really good. I like your slides. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had, I had to throw some Star Trek in there, but just because. Oh, for sure. Just because, yeah, just just to keep me interested, right? <laughs> yep. Well, that was so, a great birthday uh, surprise. <laughs> thank you. Thank glad you. glad you enjoyed it. Happy birthday twice. Thank you. Oh, we never sang happy birthday for you, Arnold. You're probably That's eating your cake right. already, too. Right. Just happy just... birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.
very belated birthday to Arnold. Happy birthday to you. Hey, Mark, what are you going to do for my 70th? Oh, uh, well, you know, you just never know. I've actually got a couple of ideas, but um, they depend on some other events. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. You got, you got like half a year to go. Or... <laughs> I may have to come up with something else because I don't know that those events are going to happen between now and say June. Well, mm -hmm. July, but you know. Well, they may just buy you out and you just say, bye Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was actually kind of the, the, the context of the webinar I was thinking about, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. So Mark, Mike Gorman, what did he say? I did not have a question. What screams out at me is to design a database to which you write all your log records. That said, does each log record type you have give you the ability to write the log record data in a CSV that you could then write to a database? Yep, you could do that. I thought about that and what I decided, the reason I decided not to do that was because that just meant I had one more server or one more database to deal with. And I would still have to write queries and more code to process that log. And because Honeycomb was free and because the query stuff is, is uh, probably nicer than what I would write for myself, um, I just decided to go with that. You can certainly do that. You know, there's um, there's definitely places that that would make more sense, like a high security environment. You might not want to use Honeycomb or um, Sumo Logic is another one. Uh, one of their competitors is Sumo Logic, um, and there's there's plenty of others. And there's actually also um, there's some open source tools out there for this. I just I didn't want to create any more work. Um, I was trying to to get out of some work and to be able to give somebody something that they didn't have to manage, you know, just one more thing to deal with. And so that's why uh, I use this. He says, right, I get that. Just that, I don't know what he says, that would that give you the ability to know what your users are doing with the application. Um, but can't you do that anyway with the honeycomb? Yeah, yeah. The, so, the add um, metrics method yeah. um, allows you to do that because you can you can put whatever values you want in that CSV that had the date and the time and um, the sales number. I mean, those those values could be anything. Um, you know, we haven't we haven't done any of that yet, but uh, it's definitely going to happen because I want to be able to to, to tell what parts of the app people are using and what parts of the app they aren't using and you know not on an individual basis because you know i say i don't care about a particular in any one individual um, that doesn't really sound very good but what i really care about is across ten thousand users if there's a part of the program that one or two percent of the pre people are using there's a reason either it doesn't work as well as they want it doesn't do what they want or they just don't need it and so you know maybe it's something that we don't need to spend more time on and the flip side of that is if there's a part of the program that you know 80 percent or more of the users use every single day then that's a part of the program we really need to focus on from a user experience perspective from a performance perspective and so on and so that's what I'm hoping to get out of it uh, in the long run is um, just kind of how that uh, it, to get that data in place so I can see what's going on in, in the application itself. You know, sometimes that's deceiving because sometimes, you know, you put features in and you really don't document it or, or publicize it much and it's there. And people don't know until like years later it goes, you know, it'd be nice if you could do that. Oh yeah, we did that three years ago. And I go, oh my God, why didn't you tell us, you know? Yeah, that's kind of on us. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, definitely for sure on that. We've, uh, all of us have done that. 
and continue to because sometimes you do <laughs> stuff to, <laughs> to test, you know, to test. Yeah, that, that happens. Or we have good ideas that we just didn't let other people know about. So, so Mike, yeah. what do you think? You think we should let Mark go? Uh, I, I, if we do, we better give him a pretty good severance package. But uh, no, think I think so? we need to. I think they think we need to hold on to him for a little while because he's. I think he's still useful. Yeah, I'm on well, board for that. He, he, he's trying to. <laughs> he's trying to work his way out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's all about trying to make your life easier. This is this is something that, that has always irritated the heck out of my dad because he would give me a job and say, "Could you just do this?" And I would sit there and I would think and I or I do it really slowly and really examine what it was I was doing, and uh, and and he would, "Could you just do the job?" And I go, "No, no, it's the job is too hard. I'm trying to find a way to make it easier." And, uh, and yeah, it just like seemed to piss him off so much. But because of that. I'm, I was doing exactly what Mark is talking about here. I was saying, "Hey, I'm working too hard. How can I make? How can I improve the world here?" So, or farm it out, or or farm it out, or whatever. You know, or create a tool to to maximize your effort. That's all about engineering, isn't it? No, well, well, right. So, uh, Mark, thanks again, and John, you're ready to wrap it up. For the wrap week? it up. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, Sure. Appreciate the effort that you put in, like two years worth um, or more. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, not quite that much, but we did talk about it for two years. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> now, now my work begins. There you go. Okay. All right. So look, I got my book. For the... That's kind of free. Yeah, I, I see my name at the top of the bill yeah. there. So I, I better start. Uh, I, I think we ha we still have a fair bit of work to do on our on our little uh, project that we've been working on. So. Oh, I thought you would just build a little program that would implement Honeycomb in in that app that you're building. Uh, well, you know what, we we, we may end up putting. Well, I don't know if it would it'd be useful there because in that particular case, we're talking about lists, and uh, lists don't tend to do processes in most cases. They're just showing stuff. So. Hmm. But, but you can always track be. certain things, like when you get to an edge case. How often do you get to this edge case, and who the heck's doing it? Well, and I suppose for the metrics might be useful. It's like find out how many times do, real, do people real actually create multi-level sorts in their list boxes. Personally, I think it's hardly ever, but uh, people seem to think it's a critical feature that must be there. But I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion that nobody uses it. Okay. <laughs> like your dad would say, you're thinking too hard, son. Just get it done. Yeah, yeah. And I go, no, 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 no. Got to consider it some more. Got to understand it. <laughs> All so right. that's uh, that's October thirtieth. So that's when we'll have the costume contest. Is oh, oh dear! I and you're the presenter, so you get you get to judge. Oh, okay, I was going to say as long as I don't have to dress up because I'm not a dress up kind of guy. Well, it's optional. It's optional. <laughs> <laughs> you know that John does enough for all of us. That's John true. is a trooper. He does. He carry he carries the weight. Mm -hmm. Just, you know. He has a whole warehouse just with his costumes. That's right. <laughs> okay, okay, first, warehouse. Now what you have to do is you have to now dress up as Atlas to uh, to fit the bill. Oh. <laughs> I don't even know how that guy dresses, but hey, dress appropriately, right? Yep. That's the thing. Bring how do you one earth. Bring it back to the rules? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it. It doesn't matter what clothes you're wearing, just bring an earth. You're fine. <laughs> just bring an earth and that's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, see, that would have been a great image to start the slideshow with. Was that this is you carrying the weight? Well, that or Sisyphus, you know, that was that's the other option. Yeah. Even <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, let's wrap up. We got um, normal week then uh, Monday, Niantis, Wednesday, open webinar, and uh, Thursday, net talk, and then right back here with Mike. So there you go. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate y'all coming. And stay home and stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks again, Mark. And we'll see you guys around. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Have a good week. And.